Hi, I'm Sam Quentin, writer, creator of 47 Furious Tales and owner of Sonopa Publishing. You can find me on Twitter at LL Sonopa, Instagram at Sonopa Publishing, and Facebook at Sonopa Publishing. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Hi, I'm Alexia Feldhausen, and I'm the artist on 47 Furious Tales. You can find my work on Instagram at Lexa Musa or on Facebook at Alexia Velt Art. And you are listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the movie and video game industries and of course i'm your host kurt sasso we are joined today by two very talented creative people on this very packed two geeks talking interview session this weekend they have a kickstart we are joined by the very talented and i gotta put it to the screen here sam quinton and alexia Feldhausen. Veldhausen, thank you. There you go. <laughs> How are you both doing today? I'm having a great day. Yourself? I'm doing good, doing good. We're going to jump right into this here. You have created a comic that I personally love because I love the uh, the Japanese Edo period slash samurai period of you know that type of history. It's what I kind of went to art history school for and all that other jazz as well, too. So I loved the comic. I loved the the beautiful artwork. I loved everything that was done about it. But for those that don't know anything about 47 Furious Tales, tell us what it's all about. 47 Furious Tales is the comic book retelling of the story of the 47 Ronin, the Eiko incident from early 18th century Japan's history. So we have taken this and told the story using several key principal characters uh, and all of our characters in anthropomorphic animal form. So we have uh, samurai squirrels and foxes and rabbits and um, monkey bandits and uh, corrupt shogunate officials who are depicted as rats have started the story in a way that's not typical for the telling of this tale. We took and started with issue one in this 12 issue limited series, and we backed up to before Asano Naganori had to begin his trip to Edo for his, uh, his next uh, service tour there. We introduced our characters through issue one and issue two, uh, some of our, our secondary issues that were you know, common during that era, particularly the uh, surge and banditry that uh, a lot of the, the daimyos were dealing with, which tended to spike along those times when um, those officials were on their way to Edo because they would take an entourage of samurai with them. And so you would see bandits trying to take advantage of that period of absence for the larger portion of, of, the, of the samurai uh, cast. Um, so we introduced that and our principal adversary antagonist, uh, Kira, who is um, largely considered to have been a corrupt shogunate official and who was instrumental in the fall of Asano Naganori. We are going into issue three, which is a really very action intense episode uh, dealing with uh, this, the samurai who were left in Aiko, dealing with the gray wolf monkey bandits who were preying upon the, uh, the province. And uh, a little bit of information on uh, Asano's trek to Edo. So it's a, it's a fun, fun issue. Looking at uh, the ethics then of these types of notable historical figures, what did you have to deal with in order to make sure that this tale was told the way you wanted it to tell the the history of this event is largely recorded through stage dramatizations because at the time when this occurred the shogun did not want to popularize this sort of action and it was the the people who latched on to this this notion of these samurai who held on to their duty to their to their lord now this is um something of a controversial point because you get people who side with the idea that as samurai their first loyalty should have been to the edict of the shogun and then others who uh, firmly convinced that their duty to their uh their daimyo takes takes precedent so you have this kind of conflict in the interpretation of bushido but there are large sections of that period between the death of Asano Naganori and the revenge of the 47, where there's just reference to what was going on with those uh, 47. 
And so you have to fill in the holes between the dramatizations, what little is recorded in the history, and the data that is recorded, say, for example, at the uh, the temple where the 47 are interred, uh, and then try and fill in the narrative in between. Because a lot of the data was, of course, lost to time, uh, largely due to warfare, not just you know, conflict between other other daimyo and samurai, which was largely pacified by then, but also particularly uh, the the Second World War destroyed a lot of records at that time too. So, it's um, been a challenge, but one that uh, allowed us a little bit of artistic liberty, so that we could try and put like a little bit more stress. For for example, on this first part where we're dealing with the banditry uh, aspect, that gave us a little room to flex our creative muscles and kind of build the story into something that flowed more naturally in the uh, sequential narrative of a comic book medium. Then looking at the art style here, which is truly beautiful, uh, Alexia, you did an incredible job with it here. When he first got the script for the, for the first couple of issues, what was the first thing that came through your mind from a creative perspective? For me, because of the period, and I'm also a huge fan of the Edo period of Japanese history, I really wanted to evoke that Japanese woodblock print style actually kind of always inspired me throughout my life. So this um, this project really gave me the chance to really explore it in its fullest. I decided to really go full force with the ink wash and the suggestive shadows and to cor- uh, incorporate the animal characters within that style, which was a bit of a challenge in the beginning, but uh, I'd say I figured it out. I can tell it's a, a, one, a period that you enjoy because I can see the prints behind you there. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. Looking at then the characters, because, you know, using anthropomorphic characters, especially from a creative medium, and especially with the style that you're going for, did you use certain styles for certain animals or did you kind of just try to keep it consistent all the way through then? Oh, I try to keep it consistent all the way. I did have to figure out how to draw these animals in the beginning because I never really drawn them before. I'm not super known for drawing animal characters. Obviously the the project called for that. So I had to first really figure out and cement my approach to drawing these characters. I had to simplify the heads and the features and then try to mix that up with, you know, the idea of anthropomorphism. Basically you're using animal features, but with a human body, if you will. So trying to figure all that out and, um, like I said, trying to kind of simplify things into basic shapes because that's how my brain works, um, that helped me kind of solidify how I would then draw all these animals. And now I'd like to say I've got enough experience that it's become more or less second nature. As you were going throughout the series, as you were drawing it, was there there a scene or was there something that just... Once you put it onto page, it was just, it, it was like, wow, this is, this is amazing. I didn't um, have that initially because when I first started working on this, and I'm talking very specifically about the first double page spread in issue one, which is a depiction of the actual gravestones of the actual 47 Ronin. You know, thank goodness we have Google and people who actually went to the grave sites where the uh, 47 are interred. They took fantastic pictures of these gravestones. I was able to just take that, give my own little twist. So when I first started um, drawing and inking this scene, because it's literally just the gravestones, I thought, oh man, this is so boring. Nobody's going to like this, but, you know, it kind of has to be done to kind of set the stage. Um, That somehow turned into one of the most iconic imageries of the entire series. Every time... Um, somebody sees it, I just get very positive reactions to it. But again, I didn't really look at it that way. I was more looking at it like, oh, they're just boring gravestones that nobody's going to care about. (laughs) But people seem to be really um, impressed by it. And again, it does give you the sense of, okay, you know, this is a legend. This is a story from the past. And, you know, our heroes did make it to the end. Their actions made such an impact on Japanese society and history that they're still being remembered to this day. Because this is such a, a, a huge aspect of, of history, and this is for either of you, between the, the historical depictions, not only in, in what was written, but what's been fan, fantasized by Hollywood and by everything like that, what aspect of the research surprised you when you were first starting to put this series together that you maybe didn't know about? 
That's a great question. And I have a couple of really good examples. Doing the research to get some of the, the detailed points that were recorded, to look for those, those really dramatic moments, those things that stand out. Um, there were some really incredible things that I found out. So, for example, one of the 47, during the time after Asano's death, leading up until and in, in the interim time between that and they seeking their revenge, he actually went to work for the architect that designed Kira's mansion, went to work for him, married the man's daughter, and through that gained access to Kira's mansion. And from there was able to implement some things that really made the final assault on Kira's mansion much more effective. And in the end, actually much, much less bloody than it would have been. One thing that I think we often forget is that warfare is bloody, it's messy, and usually, usually uh, it is the civilians who pay the highest cost. That was not the case in this instant. In point of fact, the 47, when they attacked Kira's manor, when they attacked his mansion, there were no civilian casualties. They made sure the women and children got out and any uh, non-combatants were left unharmed with the sole exception of Kira himself. That's something that I think doesn't get a whole lot of attention, uh, that there was a, a very specific care that was taken uh, with this attack when in, in really they could have just set fire to the whole thing and killed anyone who tried to leave. But rather than doing that, they approached it with a, an incredible, incredibly uh, surgical strike that I think any, any modern military theorist should, should be uh, admiring. The other thing too, we look a lot at uh, the, the younger, the younger uh, members of the 47 who were participating in this. And when you look at, you know, a 13-year-old who's left alive after all of his colleagues commit seppuku and then is um, ordered to live out his life, you know, and is treated with respect for his participation and then is interred with his fellows, there's a, a really interesting um, parallel in that to the whole idea of almost this reincarnation kind of aspect of new life pr proceeding from death. It, it really does add something to that tale, to that story, uh, that this, this young, uh, young samurai who at the time of uh, the attack on Kira's Manor was only some 13 years old, participated in this, was actually key in several elements to it, uh, is well regarded and well remembered, not just because he was the one who was left to survive and to live because of his age, but also because he was an active participant and combatant and had been an active um, samurai for Asano since he was 10 years old. So there's, there's a lot of story uh, to that in and of itself, I think doesn't get explored enough. So there, there was those key incidents. There was uh, the uh, information about Yahe and Yasube and their relationship to one another uh, as um, father-in-law, son as father-in-law, son-in-law, incredible stories about their lives that preceded this incident. It's, it's really a, a story of many, many remarkable people who forged this leg legend together. <laughs> looking, at the, looking at the themes of this particular story and, and these three volumes that you currently have as well too, as a, and we'll start with you, Alexia, as an artist, what theme spoke to you as a creative person? I think one of the themes is, is a sense of fraternity and loyalty and you'll see that throughout the series as we progress to the finale you know these these men who live by a certain code they really had each other's backs and they had the backs of their lord we can relate to it to a degree obviously we don't have that same structure or our societal structure anymore where we would literally give up our lives for somebody who's our superior but they were also willing to do it for each other and I think that is something that resonates with a lot of people that uh, I always find very interesting about the aspects of samurai culture as a whole. Another theme, and this is just me being a blatant uh, geek about it, is just that you get to, I get to draw samurai battles with swords. I mean, 
that's just that was more of enough reason for me to even be drawing it in the first place. Because again, I'm a big fan of the genre. The especially when you look at a series like Vagabond, which is a very uh, famous manga series about Miyamoto Musashi, you see that there's always a tension build up to each fight and each battle, and um, you have those classic moments where they're staring at each other for like hours on end before they finally move towards each other and strike and it's all over in one, you know, in one strike and in two seconds. Not saying that I'm necessarily trying to replicate that in its entirety, but I'm trying to replicate that same sense of suspense, you know, just just that, that feeling that you're, again, watching a samurai epic. So, I mean, I don't know if you want to call it a theme, but it's definitely one of the things that attracted me to the story. But there's so much in terms of visual culture, especially with Kurosawa and all of his films and all of that stuff. And obviously you, you can't have a, a samurai film or a, or a film about samurai without at least referencing Kurosawa when it comes to his visuals as well. Not only just with Seven Samurai, but with every film that he created, just his style of movement and his his angles were just incredible light and shadow as well too but mm -hmm. uh, did you draw from any of, of those types of references as well when you were creating the action of of these scenes not super consciously probably more on a subconscious level because we as creatives we are basically the pro whatever we put out is more or less a product of everything that we ourselves have consumed and ingested creatively um so like i said i mentioned vagabond already um, but I'm also a big fan of Samurai Champloo. And yes, of course, I'm a big fan of the Kurosawa films. All those elements that I've already taken in as a fan kind of ac accumulated and put together into my own interpretations for a narrative story. When it comes to very specific details, or I'm not sure how I'm going to approach depicting something, especially because... I put a lot of effort and brain work into the black and white before I move on to colors. Uh, I'm always looking at my favorite comic book artists and see how they do things. So I look a lot at Matteo Scalera. I look a lot at Sean Murphy. Um, I was even looking at Jerome Peña a little bit and Jorge Safino to see how they would depict certain things, how they would use black and white and grays um, to really help me out whenever I got stuck. But I think in terms of the actual angles and shots, it's probably, like I mentioned before, an accumulation of everything that I have consumed myself in terms of samurai stories. Now, from a writing perspective, I was very conscious of Akira Kurosawa's work because I'm a huge fan of his films. And so it, this shows through a lot, particularly in issue one, where we have pages and a lot of people don't actually even notice this until after they go back for a second read or a third read we have pages that are completely silent where the only thing on that page is the depiction of the action from the writing perspective this was a very, very conscious decision to try and call back to those really intense moments leading up to fight scenes that the Kira Kurosawa would depict seven samurai is a good example of this where some of the only sound that you would hear would be wind on the mic you know that would literally be like the only thing that you would be hearing in some of those moments and the idea is to let the the visual aspects tell the story and let the brain fill in the rest so that the reader isn't distracted in that moment with the words that they get to be fully immersed in the action we've used that technique in issue one uh in issue two somewhat and certainly in issue three something you you should get used to seeing in 47 furious tales in particularly key action episodes you'll see some silent panels there to try and help with that immersion how's the the pacing then and from a both from a writing aspect and from a artistic aspect Pacing from an American perspective versus a European perspective, did you find a balance between that when it came to the storytelling or was it kind of pretty structured as it was or was there flexibility? Well, from the writing perspective, the, the first big challenge was to pace out the individual episodes of the issues between the entire narrative. And that's how we got to a 12 issue limited series was by breaking that up in the outline. With the, the panel layout, I mean, I'll be the first person to admit I'm still learning a lot about writing for sequential art. So 
I had the, the good fortune of dealing with a professional who was professionally trained at the Kubert School, i.e. Alexia Veldhausen, so that when my, my panels may need some work, i.e. Uh, if we need an, an additional panel or two because the action that's being described is more indicative of, of four panels rather than two or something like that, as we go through the editorial process, we're able to make that correction. Yeah, as Sam was saying, um, we go through the script together because it's a real collaborative effort. He'll send me probably draft number five for him, and then it'll be my first draft. And then we'll go through it, just as we did with the outline. Sorry, let me actually step back here. We started off with an outline after he pitched the idea to me. I would point out that I've been reading comics since I was 15. So I like to say I have a bit of a sense of what it would be a decent ebb and flow within a story arc which usually consists out of five or six issues per story arc. So in this case, since we were doing 12, we had to make sure that we hit certain beats within the series as a whole. So looking at that first, I was like, okay, you have this build up to a very pivotal point in the story, but then, you know, we got to move that either to issue, you know, X or issue Y to make, you know, keep the flow going. So that's kind of what we looked at first is the action and the ebb and flow of the story and make sure that it doesn't become too stagnant. As Sam mentioned before, there was actually a surprisingly amount of espionage, if you will, in that story and what they were doing, not just from the Ronin's um, camp, but also from the bad guy, Kira. He was setting off prostitutes to target and spy on the leader of the Ronin. That's very, it, it is intriguing stuff, but technically not an awful lot happens you know you don't really get a lot of fight scenes that way so we're trying to come up with a balance where it doesn't become too boring but it's also not just action 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 all the time because that's not what the story was about either it was a bit of a balance of the two going back to a script for issue one for example i would go over it with him and be like okay We got a couple of what we call talking head pages, which is great because you need that exposition for people to understand, obviously. Again, we have to make sure that's not too much talking heads because, again, this is a samurai story. So we want to get some action in as well. Together, we tried figuring out what would be the best way, the most exciting way, an interesting way to tell the story. And then, you know, I just went to work and doing the narrative artist sequential storytelling, which is the most challenging part of making comics. You know, people might think that, oh, it's having to draw an army of people or an army of samurai squirrels fighting each other. And like, that is challenging and maybe even a tiny bit tedious at times, but that's not the hardest part of comics. The hardest part of comics is breaking every action down into panels, making sure that every shot is clear, that everything that you see in a panel clearly depicts what you're trying to say, and then puzzling that all together or tetrising it together, if you will, into an exciting reading flow within the page. And then every page that needs to be cohesive with the page that comes after that. And you also need to be aware of like page turner moments where it's like, are you going to give everything away in one page or are you going to have a little bit of suspense and then make people turn on the next page and then have the big revelation. So it's all these little things that you have to think about when you're doing comics, especially when you're doing uh, comics that has a lot of action scenes in them. Sorry, I could go on about this for hours, but I'm sure that'll bore everybody to tears. (laughs) From a a creative process then, and this is for both of you, what is the most difficult part of your creative process? I think from the writer perspective, for me anyway, the hardest part is trying to determine which parts you're going to rely upon the visuals, the actual sequential art to tell the story and what really needs to be in, in text bubbles, thought bubbles, things like that. I think that um, in this story in particular, less is usually more with regard to text, um, but certainly uh, there are some elements that you you need in there for that, say, for example, to establish the timeline. I think that's actually very, very critical in numerous parts of the story. Um, but that has been one of the bigger challenges from the writing perspective. It really is the breaking down the, the script into layouts, as we call them, trying to figure out exactly how each page is going to look. 
And then I think, yeah, the second hardest thing is actually drawing it all. <laughs> because, um, you know, it's, uh, it's frustrating sometimes. Sometimes you're trying to just get a pose right or foreshortening right. And you're just like struggling with it. You can't seem to get it right. And it can be a struggle. But definitely, I think the, the thing that really breaks one's brain is just trying to figure out the pacing of it all as a whole. It also sounds like in your communication back and forth with each other that uh, you edited this this series a lot. What did you edit out that you wish you could have kept in? <laughs> Can I Nothing. I don't have anything that we've edited out that I'd like to keep in. I, That's um, not true. That's not true. Not for, you wanted everybody to be squirrels. I, I, and I don't want that. I, I don't want that back now because I, I acknowledge that I wouldn't want to keep that. No, but, that's, but you, you got to answer the question, Sam. The like, question there was an idea. That the we question had to was, change. what have you edited out that you would like to put back in? I don't want to put that back in. I'm glad we changed that. So, yeah. Now, I, you know what you want to put back in? What? More horses. No, I think we got enough horses the first two two episodes. I don't know. You're just you're just being nice now. May, you know, we'll we'll have we'll have more horses in episode five, in issue five. You know, but um, yeah, horses are a challenge to draw. So for all of you who are writing for your artists, be mindful of how many horses you put in. They are difficult. They are difficult to draw, is uh, particularly when you have to put them in proportion to other humanoid sized people in the same in the same panel. So just keep that in mind. Just to give you um, a little bit of context here, Kurt, when we were talking about the script for issue two, Sam was like, oh, we're not going to have that many horses in this issue. And I'm like, okay. And then I get the script. And it's a scene where there's an entourage of people on horses. Right. <laughs> because... Um, the leader of the of the 47 Ronin art, he's going to Edo. And obviously they were doing that on horseback and he was bringing a whole party with him. So it was literally an entourage of horses that I had to draw. So every time he claims there's not going to be any horses in the issue, I just don't believe him anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so it's become a bit of a running joke between well, us. Well, you have the script for issue three. So you know how few horses we have in that one. But I'm just holding my breath from issue four and, and so on. <laughs> what is the wisest thing that you have ever heard someone say to you that has stuck with you? You are only defeated when you stop fighting. The art of war. Yeah. Uh, an anglicized translation of it. My main martial arts instructor, Sensei Reggie Camp, when we were um, back when I was still fighting competitively in the late 80s and early 90s. He would tell it to everyone. He's like, you're, you're only, only defeated when you stop fighting. You only lose when you give up. He's like, you may have setbacks. You may have little temporary defeats, things that hold you back. But so long as you, you get back up and keep fighting, you're, you're never defeated. And that proves very true. We, we see that in, in many aspects of life. We see that in creative aspects when you run into something that you have trouble uh, getting the writing to make sense and you just keep at it and you keep at it and you keep at it until you find a way to make it work, to convey the scene you're trying to describe, to tell the story you're trying to tell. You see it in business where you, you keep fighting and you find solutions to the problems that arise until your, your product is out at the best quality you can make. Uh, you see it in your personal life where you work on your relationships and work on your relationships to keep them sustained and healthy. Um, and even in, in uh, activities like the, the crowdfunding that we do, issue one for 47 Furious Tales failed to fund the first time. So we worked on it and worked on it and worked on it and came back and it funded fine the second time. Issue two, the same way. And issue three is it's literally just a matter of you keep working until you succeed and then you keep working on the next project and so long as you don't give up you're never defeated <laughs> mine's not that deep <laughs> mine is more about my artistic journey oh that sounds really pretentious <laughs> basically this is really <laughs> the advice that i got had a lot to do with what i was doing as an artist i was i think that was the first time i went over to mateo scalera's table at new york comic-con and I saw him working on a commission. He was just, well, he's one of those rare artists that uses um, brush and ink. And I'm saying rare because it is becoming more rare these days. But he was just letting that flow and just like 
it was basically like matching happening in front of your eyes. That's how I experienced it at the time. And he basically told me, don't be afraid of the ink. And the moment he said that, something clicked in my brain. Suddenly, just everything fell into place in terms of the style that I wanted to use or the way that I wanted to approach inking. And it's something that I've basically incorporated and developed over time that, you know, you're looking at a time capsule of that development now in 47. And, and I think you can actually apply that idea of not being afraid of a medium over not being afraid of the art itself to a lot of different aspects. So like if you're uncomfortable with drawing a whole bunch of animals or drawing horses, do it. Just do it because that's how you get better at it. If you're uncomfortable inking with Russian ink, just do it because, you know, it's the only way you're going to get better. And it basically just gives you the freedom and it breaks down the, all those inhibitions that you put upon yourself conscious, uh, consciously or subconsciously to really explore things that you might not have done before. I never would have imagined that I would be drawing a book about samurai squirrels, <laughs> but here we are. You know, so it, it really is all about just taking chances, letting go of the fears that might be holding you back. Everyone has one or two people that inspire them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? I'll take that first. I actually draw a lot of inspiration as far as for creating comics from some people who I hold in particularly high regard. So, of course, Neil Gaiman is um, a huge inspiration. Jimmy Palmiotti, Billy Tushi, Brian Polito. Jay Anacleto. Uh, these are, are people who, whose works I have, I'm sorry, and Amanda Connor, can't forget her, who were truly inspiring to me for years. And now, as I find myself creating indie comics, several of the contemporaries that I support through crowdfunding, whose work I enjoy, who uh, instantly have now started supporting mine, which is just mind-blowing to me, folks like uh, Madeline Holly Rossing, Mike Shea, Sam Johnson, Adam Watson, Raj Mahan, Greg Harms. Uh, these are folks whose who's work just is absolutely incredible. Joey Pineda, who, who does simply fantastic comics about the music industry. This kind of work just leaps off the page, Jimmy. And then you've got people who are doing work that maybe haven't gotten as much recognition as you would expect, certainly not as much as they deserve, like Brian Hawkins. Brian Hawkins may be one of the best comic writers there is right now. And he, he just doesn't get that much attention. And he really does deserve it. His work is incredible. These people continuously inspire me to try and do better in my writing, to work harder, and to continue to focus on the quality we're putting into our books. As an avid comic book reader, that inspiration is always kind of changing and expanding, probably is a better word. I think the, the two people that inspired me the most at a very, I guess, important moment in my life were J. Scott Campbell, because it was his work that made me want to become a comic book artist initially. And Yoji Shinkawa, who is the concept artist on the Middle Gear Solid series, his style is the one that I've always kind of tried to evoke, um, especially now with 47. So those are the two main inspirations. Now, I've already mentioned guys like Sean Murphy, Mateo Scalera, and Jorge Safino. Um, but like I said, because I'm constantly reading comics from my favorite artists, and I follow so many artists and see what they're doing, all of that is highly inspirational. So like what Eric Canetti is doing right now with Arc Athena, or what Sean Crystal, aka Ink Pulp, was doing with his stuff, it's all just like super inspiring because they kind of proven that we can do it. You know, you can go out there on your own and you don't have to be reliant on the big two anymore. You know, these crowdfunding platforms have made it possible. We can just venture out on our own and that people really are interested in what we as an individual creator have to offer versus being attached to uh, a big IP. So they've been extremely, extremely inspirational. Ramon Perez is another one, the man who runs Raid Studios. So all of these guys have been just great examples on how to be. Uh, I think another one that I'm not sure if a lot of folks on your channel might have heard of her, but Loish, she, who's also from the Netherlands, by the way, I'm from the Netherlands in case you didn't know. Um, she's been 
also a huge inspiration to me in terms of how to approach social media as an artist, because she is a quintessential example of somebody who managed to break away, not just from any big IPs or big companies, but also just from client work. And she's able to basically sustain herself doing her own work and people pay her for it gladly because it is fantastic. Uh, but the way that she has built that up is just, it's an inspiration to a lot of people. And I'd include myself in that. So yeah, there's just, there's always so many people to look at, to see what they're doing, um, to learn from. The great thing is, is that a lot of these folks, if you reach out to them, they're very, very approachable and they're more than willing to help you out if they can. So that's been just really surprising and really heartwarming to see all the support that you can get from all these fellow professionals just by reaching out to them. From a professional standpoint, you both have created amazing works and you're both working together, of course, on 47 Furious Tales. So from a professional standpoint, you are both successful. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Oh, that's, that's personal. That's a real personal question. Uh, in some aspects, yes, because I set out to become a comic book artist at the age of nine because I saw J. Scott Campbell's as Danger Girl. And now I can say that I am. So in that sense, yes, I am very successful. I guess at this point, it's a matter of a little bit of stability. Because as Sam mentioned, our Kickstarters have on the initial go would fail. And then we would try again and then, you know, succeed. So uh, I would like to see us get to a point where it's not that much of an uphill battle anymore because I have to believe from everybody who has gotten the book and all the people that we've spoken to over the past four years is that we have a good product. People really enjoy the book. People enjoy the quality of the book. People enjoy the writing of the books. You know, it's not just my art, obviously. People just enjoy the overall product. Based off of that, I know that we put out a good book. It's just a matter of expanding our audience even further. Just make the Kickstarters like a little bit less of, a, of an uphill battle. I think that would be the next step on the success ladder, if you will, to the point where hopefully we'll be making, you know, I don't know, $10,000 Kickstarters. And we can then really invest further back into the project and maybe offer our fans more merchandise and more products because right now we're just very limited by by the finances like we want to give so much to our fans and the people who have been supporting us since the beginning but we just we're just so constricted by the money right now i'm really hoping that we can expand it further that we can really start giving back even more to our fans i think that would be a good way of looking at success i'm older <laughs> So I, I've had a lot of successes in my past. Uh, I was a competitive fighter in my teens and early 20s, and I counted myself very successful in that. I worked for uh, paramilitary security companies for a long time. I can honestly say that I helped save a lot of lives. I'll count that as a success. I have children who have um, happy lives, and I count that as a success. Um, I've never had uh, a lot of money, but I've never measured my success by money. So I, I can't really and won't really say whether that's successful or not. But as a creator, I count myself successful for the, the books that we've produced. And yeah, a, a part of that's the Kickstarters that we fulfilled. Every every Kickstarter that we've, we've had fund has been successfully fulfilled. Um, some have been a little late. We always get the highest quality product to the backers uh, that we can. The money from the campaigns get invested back into the product. And as a result, we have, you know, really happy backers. The next measure of success for me, I think, is whether or not I can grow Sonopa Publishing into a company that I can eventually leave to my children. And so far, I, I count that as on the path to success. We need more books. We need to con continue to grow, continue to even push the boundaries of how high a quality level we can reach. And of course, to expand the fan base so that more people can enjoy what we're making. And I think we're on the right path for that. So that's the, the next success I'm reaching for. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I try and analyze what went wrong. 
What can we have done differently? What improvements can we make? And then I measure those improvements against the um, ethics that we work under. And so long as those improvements are ethical and things that we can reasonably do, then we implement those changes and we get back up and we try again. Anytime you knock us down, we stand back up. Anytime something falls short, we push harder. And um, that can be for a lot of different things, whether it's a, a crowdfunding campaign or whether it's um, if a, a file accidentally gets corrupted or deleted and we have to recreate a product, we put in the legwork and get it done. And uh, when you can overcome stuff like that, I don't think there's a lot that can stand in your way. You just have to keep pushing. There's a, a saying that sticks with me about that is that you, you don't learn from your successes, you learn from your failures. And uh, there's a nugget of truth in that that I try and hold on to. Yeah, I'm completely with Sam on that. It's basically what he said. We look at what we could have done better and we try to improve on that. Basically, you're always just trying to be a better version of yourself every day. Even if you are successful in whatever it is that you're doing, you can always be better. I, I firmly believe that. And I'm also um, a big advocate of the philosophy that you're really only ever going to learn from your failures because that's true as an artist, um, that's how we got trained at the Kubert School is we would do an assignment, we would get critiqued on that assignment and we'd get constructive criticism. This is how, oh, you, I see what you were trying to do, but this is how you could do it better next time. So you implement all these lessons and that's what you try to do. You try to do better next time. So I think you can implement that in every aspect of your life, honestly. You always try to achieve or try to be a better version of yourself the next day. I mean, of course, failure always sucks. You're always going to have a moment where you're, you know, you're just, you're down on yourself or, you, you know, you hate the whole world because nothing is ever working in your favor. But then you, you bitch and complain about it for two seconds. Then you just like, okay, what did we do wrong? What can we do better? How can we improve it and make sure that it works next time? The young generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether they want to become a writer or an artist or whatever they'd like to do creatively. And in one case, we have the younger generation that is possibly looking to inherit Sonopa Publishing in the future. And on the other side, we have a very talented artist that is making amazing work in her own way, hopefully inspiring artists like her mentors have inspired her. How can the younger generation inspire the next generation? I think it's just by keep creating because it's a it's a constant feedback loop that happens, um, not just in art, but in, in a lot of different things in, in history as a whole. We always take the lessons from our ancestors and people that came before us. And at least I hope they, we would take and learn from that. It doesn't always happen, of course, but because, you know, we're humans. But however I inspire anybody, with 47 and all my other work, hopefully they can take that and then um, make it their own and then hopefully then inspire the next generation. Because like I said, it's just a constant feedback loop of uh, people inspiring each other, which, you know, I think it's actually really, really cool to see. Because if you really start to dig into it, you can very easily find the inspiration that somebody else that you look up to had. Like, oh, you realize that that person was looking up to somebody else and that person was looking up to somebody else. There's actually a really funny meme about it where you see um, a contemporary cartoonist at their table thinking, oh, I can never be as good at the masters. And then you see Rembrandt in his time painting his beautiful paintings, him thinking, I can never be as good at the masters. And then you see... I don't know, some Phidias, the famous sculptor from the ancient Greek times, thinking, oh, I can never be as good at the masters. And then at the end of it, you see a, uh, a caveman <laughs> doing his little paintings on the wall. And he's just like, I am the master because, you know, he's supposedly the first cloud of human civilization. <laughs> so, but it's, it's so true. If we're going to inspire the future, we have to do our best work and strive to do better. Every, every subsequent work, whether it be writing, art, games we make, um, productions we put on. But I think that if we're going to have a lingering legacy, if we're going to 
be someone who inspires other. The other thing that we have to incorporate is a, a strong ethical base to that as a writer, especially in comics. Um, you have to make sure that you're acting ethically. You have to, you know, pay your contributing artists the best wages you can manage. You have to make sure you're treating people with respect and, and not out of a sense of, of fear of being canceled, but out of a, a genuine regard for your fellow human being. I think that contrary to what uh, certain famous persons in the past may want to say, it is extraordinarily difficult to fake sincerity. So just be sincerely uh, affectionate towards the well-being of your fellow man. Create the best products you can. Don't be afraid to admit when you don't know something. Ask questions, learn, evolve, and better your technique. Make better creations as time goes on. I think that's how you how you grow a lingering legacy of inspiration for the future is by doing the best you can in all aspects of your creative endeavors. Well, I do hate to say this, Sam and Alexia, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. Um, before I let you both go, uh, tell us where we can find you and how we can support you on the internet. Certainly. So you can find me on Twitter at LL Sinopa. That's L-L-S-I-N-O-P-A for Sinopa Publishing, on Instagram as Sinopa Publishing, and on Facebook on the Sinopa Publishing page. And you can find me on Instagram at Lexa Musa. That's Lex A Moose A, all one word. And on Facebook, you can find me at Alexia Felt Art. So just the first part of my last name, Alexia Felt Art. Three words, all smushed together. Well, like I said, thank you both for coming on the show. I do greatly appreciate it. You can, of course, find and help support them on the websites and social media that they... Uh, other than that, you can find this interview and thousands of others on our website at tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com and on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT Media. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that up. Thanks for listening watching on Two Geeks Talking.